So, we have two speakers this evening. We have Philip Powell and we have Melissa Johnson. And I'm going to just do a very quick introduction of Phil, and I may get, if I get any of this wrong, then correct me, and that's, that's no problem at all. Phil brings 30 years of experience, I'll say, immersed in all things farmers' market uh, in the Ottawa area, uh, where he was involved with the Bywood market and the Parkdale market. Uh, he worked for the last 10 years uh, in Ottawa's business licensing and bylaw division. And he has served on the board, the board of Farmers' Markets Ontario as treasurer and chair. Right there, right? Uh, he's also served on committees that promote local food in the Ottawa area. He's now retired, so he gets to choose where he goes with his time, and we're particularly appreciative of the fact that he chose to come here um, and talk to you tonight. Um, and then we also have uh, Melissa Johnson, who's recently completed her Master's in Sustainability Studies at Trent, and, wait for it, her research is focused on governance and management strategies for farmers markets in Ontario. So, it was kind of nice, more than nice, uh, that we were, we were able to connect with uh, someone local doing this sort of work. Um, her work was uh, hosted by the Halliburton County Farmers Market Association, and uh, she manages two markets herself because she's a superwoman. And uh, she's very passionate about her research, and she's actively looking forward to ways to move that forward. And I was in a meeting recently where we were just breaking up, and I heard this one here talking to somebody else in the group about precisely that, about how some things could come together and some additional research could come out of that. So, so she's a, a research junkie, which is wonderful, and we're glad that she's here tonight. So two people who are really well suited to talk about farmers' markets and how farmers' markets can be at their very best um, and help build not only local farmers but also communities. So um, the one last piece of information that's an instruction that I'm going to give you is, remember I told you had this is a paper there, okay? You've forgotten this already, I'm sure, because I wouldn't have listened to it. Uh, whenever you've got questions, please write them down so that you can go back to that piece of paper and then you can drop it in at the end of the night if you don't get a chance to ask the question. And uh, so I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to let Phil join us and do his thing. Thank you. Um, I really prefer to just speak without having a, a mic. Can everybody hear me in the back? It's okay. If you can't hear me, there are some chairs here. Just because we're in a church, it doesn't mean you just sit in the back row. Um, so please feel free if you can't hear me, if, if you have any hearing issues and you want to come up front. If you get tired listening to me, I'm not going to be upset if you move to the back either. So uh, feel free to do that. So thank you, Peter, and to the network for inviting me. Uh, when I was first asked to come, I understood it was going to be a small group of farmers, uh, maybe sitting in a Tim Hortons or something, uh, talking about your situation that I could help with some strategy. Uh, I didn't think I'd be back in the same sort of realm where I spent 30 years of my uh, life and my career. Um, I was relatively young when I left banking and started to manage the viral market. Uh, people told me that it was only the innocence of youth that allowed me to apply to a newspaper ad to actually want to try to run the viral market. Um, so I showed up at 26 and uh, was told I wouldn't last six months. They'd seen uh, six managers in the six years before me and they were going to see 20 after me and uh, that I would be just a blip on the horizon. And um, so it was like, okay, thank you for that, that's a challenge. And uh, as I said, I didn't know any better. And um, you know, some death threats came along and uh, they didn't scare me off. And uh, so after 30 years, I, I think I'm the, there are no written records, uh, but I believe I'm the longest serving markets manager in Byron's history. Um, with 30 years. I held that title for 30 years, but the last 10, uh, because they thought I had Byron under control, which was a joke, markets are never under control. Uh, I inherited all other forms of business licensing and dogs and cats. Um, so it really was a dog and pony show by the end of my career uh, with Uber, Taxi, and all those things. So had I been left with Byron and Parkdale, I may still be there today, uh, but the reality is all of that other stuff saw me uh, take an opportunity to, uh, to cash out that whole thing. So, delighted to be with you tonight. Uh, as Peter said, I have a presentation I'm going to go through, and I just ask for your indulgence. Please write down any questions you have uh, as we go through that. Um, as you probably saw, Melissa and I were struggling. I don't know what it is with technology. Uh, I did a PowerPoint because I have more time now. Uh, with all kinds of bells and whistles with pictures showing up at strategic moments and stuff. None of that is able to load for whatever reason. Uh, so what you're going to see is a straightforward one page at a time. So I'm going to try to be the animation. So uh, let's see where we go, okay? So this session, and it's interesting, there's a lot of similarities between uh, 
Peterborough and Byward and um, Kingston just because of their, of their age. So if you imagine, if you know, the market retirement home, if markets could go to retirement homes, you'd have Kingston at 200 years, uh, you guys just a couple of years ahead of Byward, if you can believe it, you were formed. What year were you formed? Is a present from uh, Peter or something for someone can tell me? What year did you get established? It's wrong. <laughs> Come on, you gotta know, there's certain it's numbers you gotta know. 1856, but they don't say that. The, the, your website says 18, 1824, is that correct? No. Were you here, Tim? Yeah, yeah 1824. We had 1824. Like all of things in market, it could be different. Do I have another number? Okay, let's say it's 1824. No one was there then, hopefully, that's in the room today. If you are, please talk to me after. I want to know your secret. Um, so, we're in a, in a senior's home, and you've got Byward, Kingston, and uh, Parkdale was a newcomer in the uh, 90 some years. Uh, so, these are the granddaddies. So, you guys have two years on Byward, established in 1826. Colonel By stood where the Parliament buildings are now, looked down at the swamp, and said that's going to be the easiest place to clear, and instructed the militia to go in there and clear it, and made a market, and the market was up and running for six months. And uh, that's how we began. Uh, I don't really know how you guys began, but uh, we want to, want to figure that out. But, you know, just like people of the same age, the markets of that history have a certain lineage. We have communities that grew up with markets that have the tradition, it's an amazing thing. But we also have sometimes what's called benign neglect, where stuff goes on forever and people don't address it just because they've all been there and that's just the way it always was, right? Um, you know, markets have challenges with that with regulation. So it's like, why can't you fix stuff like that? There's a huge background to every single issue, uh, why everybody's in the places they're in, how they got there, huge sense of ownership, whether it's one day or not uh, of the week or two days of the week or like five or seven days of the week. So it's huge. So back to my slides. Um, so Byron's 190 uh, years old. It uh, is a designated heritage district. It's considered Canada's largest uh, outdoor public market. And I think it's really important to have that conversation. A couple people were coming up to me earlier. We got into the whole notion of, you know, farmer's market, public market. There are different types of markets. So buy or buy definition is a public market, mainly because it's run by the city of Ottawa, owned by the city. And that governance is actually changing at the end of this year. That isn't why I left. Um, but it's um, uh, going to a municipal services court, so council doesn't have to deal with uh, tomato and potato issues uh, and get into all of that politics. So they're giving a group, a board of people, it still remains a city asset, but it's going to be managed by uh, a board of people uh, that will include shoppers and other people in the community uh, and some vendor reps. We don't know who all of the folks will be on that board and they will hire the staff to <coughs> run the market, but it will no longer be a city function. Um, so it's interesting, so I was the last sort of city dude to do it, uh, now it will be handed over to that, uh, that board uh, and how they choose to do it. So that's what a public market is. It has that ownership, direct management by the, the city. So Toronto, St. Lawrence is a good example, Kitchener, London, Ontario, the list goes on and on of the municipalities that run markets. When you get into something that, so, and it doesn't, it has a farmer's market component to it, it has farmers, but it has all kinds of other things. It has beaver tails. Anyone in the room not had a beaver tail? Be honest. Okay. Uh, yeah, so beaver tail is a really well known Canadian pastry that uh, our, we uh, ship off when our hockey team uh, loses, unfortunately, and after the, the celebrates. So we've got about 265 stands, 100 eligible vendors. Um, and the focus is on farm produce and our craft. Uh, there's estimated sales, some market research has been done, uh, that the sales are somewhere about $65 million a year at Byron. Now that includes beaver tails, Christmas trees, uh, all of the products year round. It's a very large number though, uh, for a very uh, large area that operates 363 days of the year. So obviously it's an economic generator, employment generator, uh, all of those farmers that are you know, going out and hiring <coughs> the of staff, uh, all kinds of equipment, all kinds of inputs, all kinds of services, utilities, uh, a real bonus for the auto area coming out of that, uh, that program. 
Uh, number one tourist attraction, you'll all recognize the dude in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Uh, the only uh, public building other than the Parliament buildings that uh, President Obama visited was the Byron Market. It was a surprise visit. I was with some of you folks down in St. Cap or sorry at um, Niagara Falls at the uh, Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Conference when he was in Byron. We were told he wasn't going to leave the airport, and there he was, uh, standing outside of the Byron Market building, having made a uh, very bad shortbread cookie famous. They have sold them uh, for the full eight years of his presidency. I think they were involved in getting him re-elected, and it should be uh, uh, opened up and viewed. They made so much money on those cookies. So. Uh, entertainment Center. This is the crisis that Byron is facing today. Uh, as the number one tourist attraction, as you know, tourists don't buy uh, heads of cauliflower and broccoli and bring them home to their hotel rooms and eat them. Um, they're looking for restaurants, bars, etc. So Byron now has 85 restaurants, 23 bars, pubs, and nightclubs, with a total of about 17,000 seats uh, that are licensed. So that's inside and outside on patios. Um, so just imagine any Friday night when the, uh, the drunks leave, uh, what that looks like the university students. So we had some um, folks talk about it and say that it's probably some of the most valuable urban real estate in North America, the four square blocks of Byward, because vendors start showing up at five o'clock in the morning, about the same time that the last drunk left. Um, and so the city crew literally has between four and five to get in there with front end boulders and everything else and get the streets somewhat clean and ready for our vendors. They show up at five in tents, market activity through to one, two in the afternoon when it starts to get the peak of the tourists after the changing the guard at Parliament Hill. Uh, and the tourists are there, and then a huge crowd and uh, people returning for the evening for dinner uh, and then for the late night bar activity. So there are, you know, they, we estimate about 50,000 visitors on the weekend. So huge numbers of people roll through the place. Our Parkdale Market, a little bit further west, if you can imagine, is about seven kilometers west of Byward. Um, it was considered too far for people to, uh, to get to to buy fresh produce nine years ago. Um, so it was established out in uh, what became sort of the Nepean area of Ottawa. Um, so it uh, has sort of kept its same footprint, uh, about 39 stands, runs seven days a week. It's really interesting. It has an employment uh, center, Tiny's Pasture, with about 12,000 civil servants uh, who come out of there at the end of the day or at lunch and buy products from the market. And then on the weekend, it has all the residents. So that's why it's available seven days a week. We really are lucky to have a few of the only seven day a week markets, almost impossible to do for farmers. Um, there's no requirement that the farmers be there. Uh, they have to, uh, they sign a contract, they have to be there four days a week guaranteed. And they do uh, see fit because the sales are good enough to be there seven days a week for the product. So coming back to that notion, I'm saying, you know, why does the city of Ottawa operate markets? And members of council will tell you it's one of the biggest headache files that they have uh, for the scale of what it is in this new city of Ottawa with a $2 billion property budget and almost a million people. Anytime a market or a dog and cat issue gets into the media, it's huge, right? Um, so, you know, why do the municipalities operate markets? It's a historic function. Uh, originally, the reason why the cities were in the business, they, they put in a well to make sure that water was safe and they created a, a market uh, to make sure there was a fresh food supply. Usually the first employee of the, the city uh, was the market's manager who filled in as the firefighter who rang the bell on whatever market shack they had to say the place was on fire and, and began the bucket brigade from the well to make sure there was water all around. And that's how it started. Uh, so that's the tradition from which we get this Peterborough, Byward, Kingston, um, Toronto kind of history and legacy of markets. Um, you know, again, back then it was to provide farmers from outside a place to come and sell. That is a legitimate thing today, to provide an opportunity for urban to meet the rural and to have local products made available, have a place for venues and vendors, to, for, sorry, for farmers to sell directly to communities. Um, most large municipalities operate markets. The authorities in the municipal act, so that's where you get your authority to do things. There's a bunch of things that aren't in there. Uh, it doesn't say you can run corner stores or you can't. So there's special sections. There used to be reams of info on public markets in that document. They were removed, unfortunately. So now it's it's been scaled down to sort of economic spheres, but it still does focus on uh, the ability for municipalities to directly operate markets uh, within their boundaries. And the Municipal Act was amended in 2007, uh, which really helped address a 13-year-old problem that we had at Byron that I'm going to start to talk about. 
Um, so this was supposed to culminate with the picture of the Guatemalan uh, toque showing up at the end, but uh, this was sort of the toque phase of Byron's 190 years, where um, we had some issues um, where we had lost our um, authority, and I'll deal with that briefly, but we tried to bring a bylaw in 1995, and uh, we were a bit ahead of our time. It was the same time as the uh, common sense um, revolution in Ontario, where it was less government and less regulation, and we were trying to bring in regulation to uh, focus on farmers and identify them and get better signage and better rules and regs. We had it being called the cucumber cops and the potato police uh, on national TV and radio. Uh, we took it all in stride, uh, and it ended up that that bylaw was uh, thrown out. And uh, so lots of, a loss of integrity for the market and a loss of erosion in consumer confidence. So it set things up just as other markets were happening uh, everywhere in Ontario, there was a renaissance of markets. Uh, that's how it all began. So, um, so again, how did we get to that point um, in 1995 and the 13 years after that? So again, in 1995, we attempted to regulate. Uh, it was the only bylaw in Ottawa's 160 years uh, that got thrown out. It was a markets bylaw, our legal department still really. Um, we had an interim bylaw that was in place for 13 years. And we used those years to try to get everybody working together. We formed a historic thing, if you can imagine, uh, 175 years into operation. We ended up with one standholder association to represent all the vendors. Uh, in 1995, when we went to council, we had a growers association that spoke French. We had a growers association that, was, that spoke English. Uh, we had a buyers and sellers group. We had an art and craft group. Uh, like it was just incredible that a market issue would come in and every, there would be 40 people at the mic and every second person contradicted everything the other person said. And uh, that didn't help anyone, certainly didn't help the decision makers. And uh, so we really worked, we brought in some community development people to work with all of vendors and came up with a process. They used to do a thing where they passed the hat. He who put the most money in the hat got the most representation with their association. Um, and that didn't work particularly well either, right? So we came up with a model that was uh, like the OFA fees and everything else that, that folks pay. Uh, there's a fee associated with our stand, uh, and everybody pays into the association, and their board is responsible for audited financial statements, AGMs, and that everybody gets invited to, artists, grower, dealer, everybody on the market, Beaver Tales gets to be there, uh, everybody on the market, and they've actually turned it now into a celebration. Uh, where they have a meal, um, it's at Christmas after everyone sort of recuperated for the month of November, uh, and they have a really positive time. And that is a huge um, bonus of something that came out of that thing that tore, tore the market apart. Literally, 1995 things, well, my life in 1995 was uh, I would wake up in the morning, if I still woke up, it was like, well, I don't know whether this is a good or a bad day, it was usually bad if I was awake. And I uh, would go downstairs and look at the newspaper, go to the obituaries. If my name wasn't there, I knew I'd have to survive another day of the market. And uh, then I, my stomach would, I'd look at the front page. If there wasn't a market story, I'd calm down enough to be able to get a coffee into it. And then I'd go through the rest of it. It was just horrific. And uh, the year culminated at Thanksgiving with a story, and those of you who read newspapers, it used to really mean something to be above the fold in the Globe and Mail, yeah. and it was Ottawa food fight, uh, and a whole story of the, the nightmare that was the Byron market. And um, so that was the year we had, um, and it literally took years of working with people to sort of, you know, say contain that and try to figure out how to build a future. Uh, how to work together. We had, you know, big group sessions, uh, something called Future Search, where everybody was involved, and uh, that really helped uh, pull things together. So, our, our assumption and consultation with stakeholders, how to get things moving. So, in 2006, a group of farmers, uh, because Ottawa had gone through an amalgamation, a group of farmers were not happy that Byron couldn't just differentiate between farmers and buyers and wood sellers because of the municipal act. Um, so a group of farmers went to uh, the mayor and there was a council and they got set up at Lambstown Park, which was, um, uh, well, still is where the CFL plays, it's where the uh, CFL stadium was. We didn't have a CFL team at that point, the place was not in great shape and the farmers started a market there. And 
and uh, that initiation going to council caused all kinds of people to say, well, what's wrong with Byron? So they got motions and said, when Byron gets the authority, it needs to start to focus on its roots of being local uh, and for the citizens of Ottawa. Um, so in 2007, there were new powers in the, uh, the Municipal Act, which meant that Ottawa could do that, and that's when we began in earnest a whole new um, process called refreshing a local tradition of a public participation process to hear from all the stakeholders to say what do you want your buyer and part markets to look like and that included vendors of all stripes art and craft buyers uh, and sellers farmers um, the beaver tail spokes patio operators everybody was involved in those consultations to sort of say, and surprisingly a lot of them said, well, this is what we thought it was all along, and it really wasn't, but I'll get into that. So by December of 08, and we were very strategic in picking that time so it could be implemented, because always this time of year, everyone gets all wound up, um, and it's the busiest time of year for farmers. So we undertook through that whole process to say, we will only do consultation outside of the busy times so it can be done thoughtfully with the best input. Between now and the end of October is not a good time to get you know, the folks that are farming or involved in the market involved in a consultation process, right? So um, we know that and, and respected that. So council approved not only bylaws, because that's the bad B word, right? This is all about regulation and red tape and, and whatever. Uh, I used to love being challenged on that because I would say, see the Rideau Center next door with 120 stores or whatever? They have leases per store that are longer than our whole bylaw. Our bylaw deals with everything from bananas to beaver tails to beets to local to patios, like buskers, you know, it's just give me a break. Like you, you can't do all of that for a $65 million a year operation uh, without having some uh, involvement uh, of order and structure. Um, so that's, that's uh, our response to you know, red tape and regulation. So council was very happy with the business plan. We always broke even, about a $1.5 million budget paid all of our salaries, uh, paid all of our direct inputs, and we paid taxes back on our market buildings. Um, so this was the, the vision that was developed, and it was interesting that there was one word that's used in this definition twice that wasn't in it when it went to city council, because we couldn't get buy-in from all the stakeholders, and we said we would do that. But after listening to all the delegations, council put it in. I'm going to read it because it's important. The Byron Market is a vibrant year-round outdoor public market in a heritage setting, providing a variety of local farm fresh products and quality local art and craft to residents and tourists. What's the word that's used twice? Local. local. So after all the, the presentations by council, it was like, that's your calling. We have grocery stores, we have the home of Farm Boy. Um, you know, we're not in the grocery store business as the city of Ottawa. We are in providing local food and, and a venue for farmers, entrepreneurs, business people, art and craft, incubation. Those were all the things that we talked about the council and seems to be really important for the market. Um, so a, a piece that's sort of missed, especially when you've been around forever, you don't sort of question how you do stuff or, or why you do it. Um, you know, you have to get the fact that farmers markets are called farmers for a reason, and it's farmers with an S and then the apostrophe after, right? That means a collective group of farmers. It's a possessive plural. So that means farmers, more than one, selling their stuff at the market. So all the other stuff with the possessive S means, so if it's hyphen and then S, that's one farmer's market, which there are those things out there, um, but people use all kinds of, of different means to describe that. But consumers want food from the, from the farmer. Uh, consumers expect to find farmers selling their homegrown fresh, uh, farm fresh products at farmer's markets. And over the years, research has been done. This stuff goes back uh, unfortunately to 2009, but it's relevant in my 30 years, I've seen the same numbers off by about 5%. Uh, this is stuff that was done on a national survey uh, across the country for Farmers Markets Canada. Uh, and the result is 92% of shoppers say buying directly from a farmer is important. 62% say it is extremely important and 30% say it is somewhat important. So you put those two numbers together, the 62 and the 30, and you get that number. Now, these things get really complicated. You think buying local food from a farmer would be easy to understand, but it's not always the case. 
uh, the situation that um, we actually, the questions had all been tested with focus groups to make sure everyone understood what they were. So the question that generated that answer is please rank the importance of buying produce from an actual farmer rather than buying produce from a person who buys the produce from a local terminal or farmers and resells it to you at the market. So it's the whole notion of any form of buying and reselling. So that question was crafted specifically uh, to make sure that we understood what that was. And that if it was clarified, there were no saying, that there's not saying, someone saying, well, I'm buying it from my, my cousin down the road or someone else or, or reselling it. The farmer, people wanted to buy from the farm. Okay? Um, and I think that's the, that's the kernel uh, of this whole thing is that the, the, uh, the respect for farmers, and that's why I'm here tonight. Um, I, you know, I've seen all kinds of bureaucrats, unfortunately, we rate really lowly uh, down on the level of um, professions that are, are respected. Any politicians in the room? Not that I want to sing to you. Unfortunately, politicians are like at the absolute lowest level, right? Um, so again, just you guys can Google this, there's all kinds of surveys, but in the top three professions, any, any suggestions of what the top three professions are most respected? Um, Fireman is ranking up there. Yeah. Doctors is down a bit. Who said nurses? nurses. You win a prize, nurses. Yes. Dentists, yep. Yeah. Who else is in the top three? Farmers. 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 Okay. So nurses, firefighters, and farmers. I work with a lot of firefighters, especially events and stuff. If anyone called themselves a firefighter and wasn't, they'd be having a problem. Okay, I'll tell you. Um, and again, a nurse. Uh, that was practicing that really wasn't a nurse and didn't have the Canadian Nurses Association behind them, there'd be a problem, right? So why have farmers allowed people who don't have their professional abilities or do what they do, take their name uh, and put it out there? So-and-so's farm. When they don't have a farm or don't grow, they may have three generations ago, but that's the kernel that is at the, this whole issue. That's the nub about buying and reselling product. And I want to be absolutely clear, there's no problem with doing that. And when we get to the next few slides, I'll show you that. Places like the Byron Market, it would not have the customer drawn appeal for a tourist that's here on a Tuesday this week when the farmers don't have a ton of product to be there. So it's great that they're there. Just fess up and say what you do. Uh, a nurse doesn't uh, you know, pretend to be a firefighter, and a farmer doesn't pretend to be a volunteer firefighter. Farmer isn't a firefighter. You know, so you need to Practice your trade, and that's what you are. And people who do other things, there's no problem with doing it. It's about transparency and respect for that function and that uh, that tradition, if you will. Um, so municipalities, BIA, service groups, and farmers operate farmers market to provide a venue for farmers because they know that's what attracts the customers, right? So that is why those groups are having it. They're not they're not interested in bringing someone that's going to compete with your independent grocer. Uh, or somebody else. They don't have an issue with a farmer, typically. They sometimes have an issue with their members who sell groceries. Uh, but because you guys don't sell canned goods and all kinds of other things, they shouldn't have an issue if the farmers out there selling their strawberries from the asparagus. Um, they have to sort it out with the groups in the community as to how much other buying and reselling people will have. Uh, but that's why, that's why they operate markets. Um, Again, we have all kinds of objectives uh, that came out with the market, but I think the most important thing is that using that, that vision from the top, it was really clear to us as staff who had to work with our legal department to write a Bible, uh, because the direction was focus on local, uh, focus on the, the farmer as the primary uh, function that you want, and so it came down to um, how to get stands, stand fees, uh, so, for example, the base fee, our real estate people got involved. Um, and, of course, these things are really hard, right, because they believe a farm stand is worth a gazillion dollars. Um, and so we ha had the vendors work directly with the real estate, and they came up with a number that said a parking space, which is 8 feet wide by 20 feet long, sorry, uh, 2.5 meters by 6 meters, um, is the equivalent of $900 a month to rent from the city. That's the value of that. 
uh, which is about three times what we charge to park a car in it. So I don't know whether that makes any sense or not. But uh, that's what they came up with as a number. So right off the bat, they said that is market value, if you will, and a farmer pays half of that, pays $450 a month. Corner stands, no matter who occupies them, pay 25% more, because that's the way it works in shopping centers and in other retail areas. Prime spaces pay more. Anyone who uses uh, any of the refreshment vendors who use utilities, uh, who generate more garbage, uh, the farmers and, and vendors typically bring all their boxes and everything home, uh, and the, the customers don't generate a lot of garbage. The refreshment people may generate garbage and should be charged appropriately. So, you know, Beaver Tales, I can't tell you what they pay, but it's a whack more than that uh, because they are there selling until 2 o'clock in the morning and, you know, uh, it's a totally different operation to pay all their own services, uh, their own garbage haulage, all that kind of stuff. So it's not every vendor isn't the same, nor should they be the same, right? They all have different demands on, on what the market is, and um, they should be, should be paying up. So uh, that's a, a thought. Um, again, the same thing for conditions of, of renewal. People had to meet their conditions from year to year to be able to do it. Um, there's a picture of beaver tails. Um, so again, it's just about establishing all the, the processes of how to get a stand, uh, how to relocate if some of the tires and leaves, uh, what the dailies are in, what the fees are at different times of the year, uh, on and on. Um, but the key element in all of it, and if you only remember one thing and want to write down one thing, uh, it is the next two slides, which are the vendor categories uh, that we developed through the process. Um, so, you know, we knew at Byward there was buying and reselling going on in, in the big story, the Globe and Mail um, story about vendors buying and reselling and pretending to be farmers. So we said, as the city, we want a category of farmers because that's the priority from the direction from council. The same thing from our craft. We want real people who do their art and craft. We also have people who import art and craft because we're a tourist area and we want that. So we want those two categories. Farmer and reseller, artist and uh, artist, buyer and reseller. But in between, we don't care. Like if you want 99 uh, categories or 98 categories between those two categories, a 1% of difference because that matters to you. Because every time we go into sessions like this after about six hours and some people walked out and whatever, the bottom line was about identifying, right? So when we got into it, we said, you classify yourselves to the association. Again, we put the onus on the association, saying, here's your homework. You canvas your folks, because they don't give us the straight goods, and you tell us how many of them still have farm operations and grow 25% of their product and how many grow 50% of what they sell over the course of the year. And that means if I stood there and counted how many whatevers they were selling uh, in a day in June versus a day in July, depending on what they were selling, would I be able to come up with those numbers as a, an average? Um, and you come back to us. Well, guess what? That was the whole, that broke it all down because once we got to resellers and growth farmers, the area between wasn't that cloudy. It was people that for mostly their operational issues who do do some buying and selling. So we call them farmer vendors and they sell mostly what they grow. So farmers, and these are on the signs of the Byward market. Anyone seen those at Byward? No, it's worth a trip just to see them. So again, that stand width, 8 feet, 2.5 meters, half of that, 4 feet, is that sign that you see not particularly well there saying farmer producer with the logos of the market, city of Ottawa, saying it's a farmer and this is what they, what they uh, produce, okay? That a farmer sells only what they grow and their issues if they are selling stuff uh, that they haven't grown, okay? The second one, farmer vendor, they sell mostly what they grow, so that's 60% plus or minus. And the way that operates is, um, we had something, it's bud and uh, bud perennials really well known, uh, and unfortunately they've just left the market this year, uh, where they were outside of the city, growing perennials, hardening them in Ottawa, bringing them to the market. It was great to have products grown right there in our uh, community, right? Uh, amazing varieties of perennials. And, uh, but because of the scale of their operation and summer students and everything else, once the perennials were finished, they wanted to have something else, so they uh, got into buying and reselling apples. We had absolutely no problem with that. 
The signage came down on the day that they switched, and as they kept moving their perennials over, they would identify them as theirs. They bought all kinds of apples, which we didn't grow locally. The selection committee had approved it, and they got the dealer's sign. They weren't having both on the stand at the same time. There's a possibility there's a yellow sign, a vendor, farmer vendor, that you can have product that you grow when you identify it, and then the product that you buy and resell for whatever reason. Um, again, that's your choice. That's your choice of that category. And their fees are somewhere in between. So it's on a daily basis for a buyer and reseller, daily permits $50 uh, for a Saturday, $25 for a farmer, $37.50 yeah, uh, for the middle category. So again, everything breaks out based on those three categories. So that's, in the end, what was agreed to as hard as that is to reach agreement. That was the compromise that, that the community uh, felt that they could live with, uh, and that's what was implemented. Um, so I'll just show you those other two signs. Um, so that's what they look like. So there's no fudging. There used to be small signs that were 8 half by 11 sheets, and they would disappear, or they'd be put at the back of the 20-foot sign of the stand that you'd need a magnifying glass to see, whatever. It's up front, it's straightforward. But the thing I want to say about it, I mean, look at the, the difference in the three stands. So I took those this week because this is a challenging time of year. So the grower stand, it's this time of year, they have their stuff from their uh, greenhouses still with hanging baskets, some rhubarb from the field, and a few other things. Very little product. They're just in their transition from their gardening time, which was really intense in the greenhouses. They do beautiful bags of mixed greens from their greenhouse. Uh, other products, but they're they're running light on product. Still have tons of bedding plants that they wish they would have sold uh, three weeks ago, but haven't. Um, but then you look at the, the farmer vendor again, greenhouse operator. That's all their product. Uh, and then the vendor stand. Yes, you can see the telltale uh, limes and lemons to the left of the, the photo. But in the middle are many of the other products that you'd expect to see. Possibly, you know, the green onions and some lettuces and stuff. No one has an issue with that vendor being there with those products and them being properly identified. In the good old days when the games were played, um, there were people that were called dealers that had been spoken and been grandfathered and literally pulled out of the main part of the market and pushed off to the side and they literally became sort of the um, lepers, if you will, of the market because they could only sell all the imported products. They couldn't sell anything that was in season and the grocery stores made sure that that happened. Meanwhile, the vendors in Byward, because local back then, my joke was that they literally called it anywhere in the Northern Hemisphere, um, would have BC cherries being sold as local. And, you know, again, at Byward, we're really close to, um, to Quebec and the, the Grand Marché in Montreal, the wholesale markets. We had people that had, you know, worn out three trucks in three years doing the runs to the market, right? um, buying and reselling trucks. So this process did it, but of course, those of you, and I, I can hear the uh, cogs, everyone's brain, how do you know whether they're the real deal or not? Well, um, the answer was, and there are any number of people in the, in the room who've been, uh, worked with Farmers Markets Ontario, uh, which is the provincial association representing farmers markets, so we took it really seriously those of us who served on the board to make sure that we did what was in the best interest of the farmers at farmers markets, understanding that the markets were the members, not the farmers, and we wanted to help them, so it was education and everything else. But what we saw as a collective was the biggest problem was municipalities and market operators didn't have the ability to do the thing we did at Ottawa without a legitimate inspection process, an autonomous, verifying process that. And so that's what the MyPIC program began uh, that was launched just about 10 years ago. And uh, that's what it, what it is. So MyPIC uh, is a program where the farmers apply to farmers markets and area to fill out a crop production plan, uh, detailed, saying what it is they're going to sell. The f markets get those, not by this is my heirloom variety of something, but they know what should be on the stand. And if they feel there's an issue with it, they can contact Farmers Markets Ontario, and a verifier will go out, who's a horticulturalist, and check the fields. It's the only way you can do it. You're saying that, that those tomatoes are yours. Let's go see them in your field. Uh, are they the, the real deal? Let's see your seed bills. Does that match up to what that variety is? 
where's the packaging for that, where's the bill for the packaging, who that, that's your land that you're on. We had scams in the Byron market where people would rent land from the National Capital Commission. Family of five, a father and four sons, uh, they would each, the old bylaw required five acres of arable land within uh, 75 miles of Ottawa. These folks had 25 acres that they could pumpkins on, hardly even harvested them, and that gave them the right to call themselves farmers of Byron. So the policies allowed that to happen as well. The benign neglect that I talked about. So to regulate and to you know, create policies, you need to understand farming and how it works. So again, we work with farmers, our board members, who are farmers who sell at markets and specialists to come up with that program at Farmers Market Ontario. So we're hoping that that can continue. Uh, it's now pay to play. It's $100 for your first application and $50 on renewal. It had been uh, a free program through Farmers Markets Ontario. So there's an opportunity to try to continue that. So City of Ottawa requires that you provide that proof. Uh, so that's how we do it. We've got a concern. We send it off to them and they do the verification to, uh, to approve that. So that's what it's all about, ensuring homegrown. We've worked in Ottawa with a local brand, so just like, does it taste of the pork? What's your local, buy local brand here? You did though, right? Was it? Okay. And it's no more? It's about to be no more. Okay, that's too bad. Because the province with great fan fanfare funded uh, a culinary food strategy and rolled that out and tried to get everyone going because that's when we created Saber Ottawa in Ottawa. But uh, that's too bad. Maybe anyway, there's a, a way to do that. So again, the proof's important to that, and it's also important that your regulation, that bottom line, that the words local, homegrown, farm fresh, other similar terms are used only to promote products that are grown and produced by the farmer. And the same thing goes with what people hear. Um, we used to have a, a going joke at Byron that you know, you'd be going down the, the strip before you came up with the signage, and somebody would be there in a bedroom would have an eight foot long sign that said, everything grows better with love. Uh, but nothing in their stand was theirs. It was all grown by someone else, but in love. Um, but so they had their, everything grows better in love. And then people would say, is this yours? And they would say yes to that. And I would remind them, usually bi-weekly or weekly, sometimes daily, when someone asks you that question, they don't mean, did you steal it? Or did you find it mysteriously in your yard? They are asking you that because that means just like, is that your child? It means, is it your lineage? Okay. So we need, a, we need a fraternity show on the produce to figure out, is that yours means yours that you grew, okay? And if it's not, like, say no, it's not. And, you know, so that's the issue, and that was the big deal with all of that when, when the lid got blown off. And the deadline for applications in our process was, was December 31st, uh, of 2008 so we could roll it out for 2009. We all stayed with bated breath waiting for the applications to come in. And there were 10 people, one of them who professed to be the biggest farmer at Byward, who did not submit an application um, because the jig was up. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't, you know, pull it out of the hat, right, to, to keep that amount of product and that size of a stand going. So it was easier to just say, that's it, I'm done. Um, you know, so it's interesting when the proof's in the pudding, um, what it can look like. So that's the Byron and Parkdale story in a nutshell. The other uh, interesting story, um, I don't know if folks have heard of the Carp Farmer's Market. It was one of the first ones that really was part of the new renaissance of markets back in the 80s. Um, and it was all about you either make it, grow it, or sell it yourself. They don't allow any buying and reselling. Um, so it's that scale, that small. They were the folks that then came into Ottawa with a whole network of folks and started the, it's called the Ottawa Farmers Market, which is just down the canal. You guys are way down the canal from where we are, but uh, they're about three kilometers down the canal from Byward uh, at Lansdowne. And uh, so they were there and then they had to move them out. Uh, I got that job because no, they were having a problem dealing with the board, so they let me do that as well. So we got them relocated uh, for a couple of years while they redeveloped Lansdowne. It's now our amazing uh, multi-use facility, and the Ottawa Farmers Market has gone back. There's something in that, and I helped negotiate that, and it's totally doable. Uh, it's called a license of occupation. So just like anyone here who's been to a hockey game, football game, whatever, had a ticket or a concert, hands up. We all have, right? That is a license of occupation. 
That says you get seat 3B for Shania Twain or whatever the show is or the senators for that period of time under these rules and regulations, and if not, you're gone. That's a license of occupation. So the Ottawa Farmers Market has a license of occupation from the City of Ottawa to run their market at Lansdowne Park with some guiding principles. And the guiding principles have just changed, but that's what they are on their vendor mix. So 51% minimum have to be my pick verified farmers. They don't allow buying and reselling, but they've actually had categories and said, this is how this shall work. 25% uh, maximum prepared food, 16% maximum art and craft, and 8% maximum refreshment. Now that is peak season when they're operating, there's some understanding of that, like the Farmers Markets Ontario uh, stuff that we quote, the 51%, which is really a Ministry of Health member, uh, but that's part of that uh, framework. Um, so that, those are their rules. So everybody who calls himself a farmer has to be verified, and they have to, when they're in operation, literally, you know, from mid to late May, June, July, August, September, October, into November, so those are the numbers they have to maintain. So they can't say, hey, we've got some extra sands, we're gonna fill in the air craft. Now at Christmas, they take over the cattle castle and they go hog wild. These limits don't apply. Uh, they bring in all kinds of other art crafts and all kinds of jams, jellies, whatever makers, but those are the uh, numbers that they use. Uh, all vendors must apply and be considered by a jury committee. And just like the Saber Auto stuff, they actually encourage their uh, prepared food folks and their um, uh, refreshment folks to buy from the market. Uh, the best selling stand at the Carp Farmers Market was back bacon on a bun. Um, when we asked them at one point in time where they got the back bacon, uh, it came from Costco. Um, so it's like, well, there's something wrong with that, right? So, uh, so those are the kind of things that you're, you're all, every operation should relate to it. Now, Beaver Tails at Byward, we're not calling ourselves a farmer's market. They order them from General Foods or wherever they get them to by the truckload, right? The Beaver Tails, based on their uh, secret recipe. Um, so, um, you know, they're allowed to be at our market. So you just create rules that are open and transparent. If anyone asks why is Beaver Tails there, uh, today, a new person couldn't do it. They were there since the 1970s, and that's where they, they began. So that sort of, in a nutshell, is my um, um, overall pitch to you. The three things to remember, and we'll do it in threes, three most trusted professions. It goes up and down between nurses, farmers, and firefighters. Um, so keep that in mind, but that's, that's your goal. And the categories, three categories. Uh, farmers sell only what they grow. Farmer Mostly what they grow, 60%. Resellers do not grow, they buy and sell. Okay? That's my presentation. Thank you. This is the kernel of this, okay? So a hundred years ago, no one had to ask what local was because you didn't have a vehicle that you could get in and get back somewhere else, right? Yeah, had to sell what you had to do. Now we have all of these other abilities and we have a framework where our federal government has to treat local for Ontario, Quebec, and Alberta and BC the same as it does for Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, New Brunswick, who are all within each other's pockets. So it's a it's a really challenging thing. And as I started to say at one point, and this is this is the challenge, people will say, well, it should be so easy to do stuff in a farmer's market. And it's like, for the love of whoever you worship, um, there's no dynamic as challenging as a farmer's market. 
uh, because there are so many interests inside, outside, all around, and no one gets it, right? And it changes every day. Like, literally, it would be easier to manage the Rita Center. Those 120 stores show up, they do what they do, they all open at 9.30, or they, you know, do whatever. Markets, it's like, oh, my kids stick, they're not going to be into later, my, you know, my cell phone battery ran out, you had signed my stand to someone else. Uh, so it goes on and on and on, and it's real and, and it's humans. When we try to bring regulation to it as the administration, the bureaucrats, it's like too much red tape. Don't overregulate. People don't need what local is. So it's you're caught between a, a rock and a hard place. So the um, it all got really and you know what the other thing that's really frustrating is when you see how things will work as a knee-jerk reaction. So when people talk about the 51% and they say, oh, that's a farmer's market, it's Ontario rule to be a farmer's market, you have to have 51% producers. No, it isn't. That came out of Queen's Park, where we were working with the Ministry of Health to try to get more robust framework for farmer's markets to make sure no one died and there were no problems. And it got to be, oh, you're going to put all this red tape on farmer's markets. And so they came in the house, in the house of, of Parliament for Ontario, said that's ridiculous, farmers don't need red tape, anything that's got 51% shall be farmers. Like, it would be nice if that could happen, right? So if we could get that tomorrow with a definition of what a farmer's market is and what they can set. So what we have now, and I don't want to say it, I sound like a politician, I'm going around it. The best thing we have is the Canadian Food Inspection interim definition of local, uh, which is the province in which it was grown, and 50 kilometers into the adjoining province. That's what's on the books for the definition of local. And that's why you can choose to use it or not, and that's why we get people to move from my farm, use all those other lovely terms, right? And the Ministry of uh, Agriculture and Food ships gazillions of dollars of commodities. And I use this example all the time. How much money is exchanged every Saturday morning in garage sales? Who regulates that? Like, who do I talk to? I got ripped off, I bought a coffee pot uh, for five bucks, and it didn't work. They guaranteed me it worked, they were gone, I never saw them again. Do I call a consumer and corporate, you know, who do I do with, right? So farmers markets, most health departments don't even work on Saturdays, so they're not gonna get to a farmers market. So a lot of things happen because it's so in flux, right? So what you need to do is come up with your own rules. You don't need to use local. You need to use from my farm, and that's why the my pick posters in Ottawa say my dis destination or my distance from the Peace Tower. I am 75 kilometers. I am 20 kilometers. Most people think it's about a drive, but that's a conversation you can have. You don't need to say, hmm, the feds aren't doing anything. Hmm, the province isn't doing anything. We're not doing anything. You can do something. Uh, start by who are farmers, who are buyers and resellers, and then worry about those other issues. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. One thing I wanted to ask was some of the vendors, farmers in our market, were told that they do not sell the same product that you're somebody else is selling. It's not in the same market. Is that a role? Well, it's not the same product. Same product. And if so, why? Why is it not the same product? Again, markets set their own their own rules, and some really small markets, they have a jury <coughs> committee or the board will decide that they're maxed out, even for the consumer. Like we had a time at Byward, and again, it was all based on seniority. Like a, they treated it like a union, right? So when you went down that strip of Byward, 34 stands in a row, more than half of them were beef steak tomatoes. Um, and the same things that people say, well, where's, you know, we go to the other markets, and there's elk, and there's eggs, and there's cheese, and anyway, these men, these men are so. At our market, we have many of them that sell, more of them sell apples, a lot of them right. sell the carrots. Yeah, you're sitting there telling some of our uh, vendors that they can't sell products like pierogies or cookies because somebody else is selling them. Does this seem like a fair rule? It, it, it depends what their rationale is. Like again, they how many? Have how many? Rationale. That's yeah. So again, that should be asked, and all those things should have a rationale. Well, why the so. question wasn't answered? She okay. refused to answer the question that I asked her. So again. Transparency is really important, and it's like how many pierogies does a market need, right? Um, so it's like our thing. You, no matter how good your idea was to make homemade ice cream, you couldn't get an outdoor stand at Byward anymore. It's the retail. So there could be history on that, but you need to work it out. My name is loathed across the country for other things where people have got together at, at Buskers festivals and the Powell name is Provile, okay? Um, we have the only pay-to-play busker program in the country environment. 
Uh, we have about 100, uh, over 100 buskers every year sign up. So they have to sign up, they have to pay a fee, and they don't get juried or anything, but because we have people just standing, they have to rotate every hour. Um, so there are ways to deal with that. I'm happy to deal with that afterwards. But that's the minutia that nobody gets, okay? Like we just spent weeks on buskers, and it was on buskers. How about horse and carriages? Like we were all over TV because of two horse and carriage services. Anything else? It's, it's coming, it's all coming back. This is like post traumatic stress for me. It's going to be a small question, yes, a small a answer. Small but there's no such thing. I think small. farmers' markets should be for farmers, not for people that are reselling. Yeah, so I mean, you have an option um, with your market to say it's not a farmer's market, that it's a public market, or you name it something else. Can and, you repeat the question, please? Oh, sorry. Excuse me, that's, that should be facilitator rules. Um, so the, the question that it was more of a statement saying that I think that farmers markets should be for farmers only, uh, point final, just that's it. Uh, that, so in a real world, that's what a definition of a farmers market would be. However, in preparing myself for tonight, because I pride myself on being well prepared, your website says, uh, come and get to know us, the Peterborough farmers market, correct spelling of farmers market, started in 1825. And since then has been bringing local, fresh produce from the farmers that grow it. Since then, the market has expanded to include fresh baking, cooking and crafts, and so much more. So what's the so much more? Um, but I mean, that, that sounds to me like you're bona fide. You've continued that tradition of only farmers selling only their product, right? Like it's theirs, like their baby. So that's... That is a decision for your community, your city, who the land is where the, the market operates. Is it a call? It could just be the Peterborough market, and this could be a farmer's market section, or everyone could be identified. There are options. All I want to do is make sure that people who buy and resell don't feel that they're not included in the tradition of being there or whatever. If that's what the community's choice is and they want to be there, as long as they identify themselves and the consumer gets to choose between going to a farmer stand and going to a buyer and reseller stand, like you saw at Byron, let them do it. And the, the, the response from the consumers at Byron and Parkdale, all kinds of loyalty back and consumers, and it stopped all the fighting and bickering, and it's just totally out of here now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the network. Uh, and Phil Powell for his great talk. I'm going to try not to repeat him, although there may be some reiteration of some of the things that he said. Um, and it's really good to see how many people are here and to know that, that there are so many people who are passionate about farmers markets. I think that farmers markets are often ground zero uh, for food politics, and it's really vital that communities come together uh, to learn about their market and to voice their concerns and brainstorm solutions to some of the challenges facing markets. I apologize for reading my notes. I'm a student and all I know how to do is read and write, so please forgive me. Uh, my name is Melissa Johnson, as Peter introduced, and I did recently, very recently, complete my master's degree at Trent University in Sustainability Studies. My thesis, uh, which was called Cultivating Change, Optimizing Farmers Markets in Ontario, looked at the range of farmers markets in Ontario uh, with a view to identifying best practices in the areas of governance, management, vendor relationships, and customer relationships. So it was a kind of a huge project. Uh, over the course of the last three years, while I was conducting my research, I gained first-hand experience as a market customer volunteer, vendor, and manager. And if I'm correct, you know, I am no longer managing farmers markets. I didn't last three years. I lasted one year. <laughs> it is a thankless job. Let's just leave it there. Um, <laughs> tonight I'm going to share with you some of my key findings uh, with a particular focus on some recommendations that are relevant to the Peterborough farmers market. But first, I'm going to briefly describe my research project. Um, I'll try not to stand in front of slides too much. <laughs> it was a collaborative, community-based project undertaken with the Halliburton County Farmers Market Association. My study
study was limited to farmers markets Ontario member markets, uh, which is why the Peterborough Saturday market was not included in my study. Using only FMO affiliated markets allowed me to start with uh, a sample group in accordance with the provincial designation of true farmers market, as Phil mentioned. Um, that means that the members, uh, the markets in my study all had vendor pools of 50% plus one primary agricultural producers. My findings are drawn from interviews with 17 market managers and administrators from all across Ontario, and you can see from the map the distribution. Um, you can see also that most of these markets were in the southern part of Ontario, except for a couple, um, and they did tend to be around the urban centres. Uh, and so these are the voices that inform my results. I should also note that all of my participants remained anonymous, which allowed them to speak freely about some of the challenges that their markets face, and it also kind of speaks to how very political our markets can be, as I think everyone in the room understands. Uh, so just for fun, I uh, organized my key findings into the four P's of farmers market performance, and I've illustrated them in this web pattern uh, to sort of indicate how intertwined they all are, uh, as you'll come to understand. So we begin with the principles. Uh, these are the foundational uh, sets of beliefs and intentions of the farmer's market. Markets used to serve a relatively uncomplicated purpose, uh, which was to get food from the countryside into the hands of people who weren't involved in food production themselves. But since about the 1960s, with the birth of the modern environmental movement and uh, major shifts in agricultural practices, the purpose of farmers markets has evolved. Farmers markets today increasingly represent an alternative to a food production, distribution, and consumption system that has eroded our trust in food safety and quality, uh, that has exploited and marginalized food producers around the globe, and that has threatened our health and the health of the planet. One alternative, a localized food system, uh, despite the hype, is not about serving a trendy, privileged, hipster demographic. It is about social justice and food system sustainability. As such, farmers markets need to really be clear about their commitment to local food. And this, again, harkens back to something that Philip was, was talking about. Um, so the commitment to local food and the people who produce it, uh, they need to really put a lot of thought into what local means to them. Because as you ask the question, what does local mean? Uh, everybody's sort of coming up with their own definition. And so that's something that I think, market by market, they need to really be clear about what it means. <clears throat> and also, these things need to be put into writing. Um, and so whether that's a mission statement, a vision statement, a mandate, and of course, many, if not all, markets do this. And I just grabbed these examples from various market websites. Uh, you don't need to read through all of them, but the point is I've highlighted that they all mention local, uh, at least one time. And a couple of them do, one says only kilometers away, one says 100 kilometers. So they're, they're sort of getting close to a definition of local. Um, I also visited the Peterborough Saturday Farmers Market to refresh myself as to where they stand, and I found it interesting um, that they describe a grocery store and then they talk about why a farmers market is not a grocery store, and I think that's pretty important. Uh, the things that I, I pulled out specifically are that grocery stores take money out of the local community, farmers markets. Uh, keep it in the local, and it keeps the profits in the hands of farmers. So that's, a, that's an excellent mandate. I think that's something they should really uh, be proud of. But the thing is, uh, the key is the word commitment. Farmers markets need to not just pay lip service to their local mandate, or they risk diluting the term local to the point of meaninglessness, uh, as we've seen with other promotional words and phrases. <laughs> this is one of my all-time favorites. I like the natural Cheetos <laughs> So, you know, local does tend to start to mean nothing after a while when you just throw it around. <laughs> so, having integrity around the local food pledge is crucial because 
uh, of the people. And so, can I see a show of hands? I think, I think some of you are customers, but I think a lot of you are also vendors in here. Uh, so this is sort of, well, it's for everyone. Uh, I want to see a show of hands. Uh, who would say that one of your top three reasons for shopping at the farmer's market has to do with the social aspect? Yeah, that's what I expect. And then, uh, more specifically, that it's about supporting your local food producers. Yes, absolutely, great. Uh, you know, so as much as the relatively recent upsurge of farmer's markets is a response to customer demand, it's also a response to the need for marketing outlets for small scale family farmers, food business entrepreneurs, and critically, for food producers committed to sustainable practices. Uh, the economic and regulatory landscapes do not tend to favor these people, and it can often hinder or even destroy established businesses or prevent fledgling businesses from ever getting off the ground. Farmers markets are uniquely positioned to support these people, and they need to continually look at how they're doing so and evaluating how successful they are at doing so. Most of the markets in my study emphasize the importance of supporting local food producers and making sure that they're making a decent living. But here's where it gets tricky. Um, vendor success does not come at the expense of other vendors. Farmers markets can operate like other uh, more cutthroat business arenas. For farmers market to thrive, it has to operate as a collaborative enterprise uh, that's deeply committed to community development. Farmers markets are central to the growing awareness that we can't operate in isolation <coughs> from one another as self-interested consumers or as aggressively competitive profit seekers. I think we all know where those roads lead. Um, those are the attitudes that are found in the corporate global food system and farmers markets must continue to stand outside of that system. And so uh, the majority of my interview participants used terms like working together as a team, happy family, in it together, harmonious environment. Um, and, and they did so because fostering this atmosphere is a high priority for governing bodies, um, as they say it is. Uh, it helps to attract and retain loyal vendors and is a major motivating factor for uh, regular and loyal customers. And so in aid of building this collaborative community-minded ethos, it's vital that decisions not be made in a vacuum. The operational matters that are usually in the hands of the governing bodies and managers must take vendor perspectives into consideration. After all, these decisions directly impact the business performance of each and every vendor. For larger markets, the prospect of Consulting with or reaching consensus among all vendors may not be feasible or manageable in every case, but there are ways to provide platforms for all voices to be heard, uh, and they are certainly worth implementing in the interest of democratic engagement. So, some examples that I've got here, um, you know, depending on the number of vendors and the organizational capacities of the farmers market, include regular. Um, meetings with all vendors, and these could be held biannually, on the shoulder seasons, or more often if there are decisions coming down the pipe. Um, another uh, possibility is private <coughs> Facebook groups that all vendors are uh, invited to join, and this allows them to voice their concerns and opinions on an ongoing basis. Um, and then another option is regular vendor surveys that you know, can be open-ended, uh, asking vendors to submit comments, or suggestions or complaints, uh, or they can pertain to specific operational changes or decisions. But of course, all of these opinions and perspectives are just dust in the wind if the market administrators don't do anything with them, which is where the paperwork comes in. And you know, some of these may seem obvious, but as Philip was saying, a lot of markets really resist these things because everybody hates bureaucracy and red tape, right? And I think farmers and food system activists maybe hate these things more than the average person. Uh, certainly some of the managers that I spoke with in my study prided themselves on skipping the paperwork 
and remaining grassrootsy and informal. But overwhelmingly, I found that markets need to prioritize um, formalized documentation of their procedures. They can, and this can and should be done uh, in a number of ways for a number of reasons. Having clear rules and regulations and bylaws uh, to which vendors and governing bodies can refer in moments of conflict is crucial. These promote accountability among market stakeholders and they lend stability to market operations. The usefulness of conflict resolution protocols can often be overlooked until a conflict is already well underway. And I think everybody's familiar with this situation. Uh, farmers markets would be wise to have something in place such as a policy on harassment, abusive conduct, discrimination, and workplace violence before such time as it's needed. Uh, and these should be designed to protect vendors, customers, volunteers, staff, and members of, of the governing body. Uh, another useful document is a strategic plan. Um, and these are an excellent way for farmers markets to put in writing their short-term and long-term goals and priorities. Um, and these plans are really great for revisiting um, every now and then to evaluate the progress of the market. And they can also outline a succession plan so that um, governance or staffing changes can proceed smoothly. And that was something that, that came up quite a bit in my research as well. People concerned about how to hand over the reins of a farmer's market to the next generation without a, a huge disruption. And finally, uh, a memorandum of understanding or some similar agreement with the city, the landlord, or the external organization, whoever you are working with, um, that outlines the long-term commitment to the farmer's market. Um, this is really important given that markets are occasional and temporary tenants uh, in their sites, and they may not be as high a priority uh, as they would like to be. And so an MOU can provide security and predictability, um, and they can ask that the farmer's market be taken into consideration or that the governing body be consulted uh, should there be any changes or disruptions to the site or circumstances of their tenancy. And so with, with these recommendations, I've outlined a number of tactics that can be undertaken internally uh, among farmers market administrators, but I imagine some of you here are customers, and so you may be wondering, what can you do? Well, assuming, and I do know, that most of you are strong supporters of local food and local producers, it's important that you be vocal with your support. The notions of voting with your wallet or with your fork are great, but passive consumption can only go so far. We, as, as customers, also need to ask questions um, and come to information sessions like this one uh, and learn about what's going on behind the scenes and spread the word. We need to demand that our farmers markets live up to their mandates uh, and hold true to their principles and not just take for granted that they are doing so. We need to talk to the local producers and food business people and advocate on their behalf. And we need to offer our assistance in whatever form that takes uh, in the face of wrongful conduct. And I won't get into the details of what that wrongful conduct might be, but we can all discuss that now, because that's it. That's all about <laughs>
Can you please talk very briefly about reconciling that with what the uh, young lady over here talked about in terms of exclusive venue? Yes. Uh, yeah, this is an issue that, that did come up quite a bit in my, my interviews. And markets take a different approach. You have some markets that are very protectionist. So each of their vendors, they consider when adding vendors, how that's going to impact this person's business. So if, if a new vendor is selling some of, some of the same products, they need to decide, is there enough demand that this isn't going to water down the profits of each? Um, but it's also something that you see more, in my experience, in smaller markets. Uh, so the smaller the market, the more they need to worry about that. The larger markets tend to be a little bit less protectionist in that way and they're just interested in adding vendors wherever possible. Um, I agree though with Philip that these things need to be very transparent, they need to be discussed at length, and vendors need to be consulted on these, on these decisions because they, they will impact the profits of each vendor. Thank you. Yeah. You talked about uh, dealing with uh, uh, wrongdoing. About you talked about dealing with wrongdoings. Yes. Uh, how do you have oversight when there's no oversight in place? <laughs> yeah, um, if we're talking about one market in particular, <laughs> uh, once a market is, is very well established uh, and very large, these things, I think, become more difficult. Uh, because this is the way it's been, and there is this idea of, of history and legacy behind the way the market is currently operating. So the idea of having to change anything is, like, forget it. Um, approaching this, I think that uh, some of the efforts that I'm hearing about, which are bringing in new perspectives into the governing body, is really, really important. Um, it's a slow process. It's definitely not going to change overnight. Um, but absolutely, having a balanced governing body and, and asking that the governing body be accountable to their, to their mandate, which should be local food, which is local food if we revisit the, the words on the website. Um, I think that that's, that's one approach. I think a very important approach also to uh, dealing with, with markets that are being unfair, let's say, <laughs> to some vendors, uh, is to bring, in the, bring the public into the conversation because customers at a farmer's market are huge advocates for the vendors and for this, this idea of local food. And if they're just happily going to the market and they have no idea that there is this huge political battle going on, they won't, you know, they'll just pay the money and leave. But if they are brought into the conversation and if they're influential people, even better. Um, I think though that word does need to get out about the specifics of the, the wrongful conduct. I'm trying to be <laughs> neutral here. Peter, can I just add something? Uh, will you take a, a friendly minute? Yes, yes. My, my other comment on that whole notion of governance is that municipalities, and it became super clear to me when I assumed responsibility for taxis and other things, municipalities didn't see Uber coming because they were so busy dealing with the taxi drivers that were before them. Um, and the same thing happened. So in the 60s and 70s, it was a disconnect. The reason why uh, cities, municipalities, have markets, encourage markets, is to provide the service to their citizens, not to the people who sell there, the vendors. That's not the stakeholder group. The reason why they do it is a, a broad service to the residents of Peterborough. So the residents of Peterborough should be saying that's what they want in the market, not a group of market vendors. So, you know, again, let's use the Rito Center. The Rito Center is not run by the 120 vendors. Uh, or national chains that are in there. It is run by Cadillac Fairview to squeak out every dollar. That's their mantra, right? So the same thing, a farmer's market should be run by a body whose interest is the community to say, let's have a community table. Let's you know, reach out, how do we reflect what's best of Peterborough, what's going on in Peterborough today, not just 
you know, we've always done it this way and these people get to, to, uh, to run things. So, you know, municipalities have, got, have learned some really hard lessons with the taxi industry that the real reason why they license businesses and get into those things is for the citizen, not just for the vendor group, not just for the taxi driver, not for the dog. And, and if, Thank if you. I can add to your addition, um, <laughs> another uh, point to make about that, I was speaking to the president of the Wakefield Farmers Market recently, and he, and I asked him about this very thing, you know, how do you uh, prevent conflict of interest inside the governing body when often, or sometimes, it's vendors who are <coughs> holding these positions. And he said at their market, they, the, the president position is a, is a community member, always a volunteer community member who is impartial. And so this is one way that they, and, and part of that person's job is to look out for conflict of interest when you are um, looking at applications. So that if there is a vendor on the board who has an interest in keeping that person out of the market, the president who has no you know, feelings one way or the other can look out for that sort of activity. So it's, again, shifting into that is, is maybe the trick in this particular situation. Uh, so I'm John Dunn. I've been a lawyer doing support for some of the vendors there. Can you get back to your slide of what the, uh, the website of the people of Harmony's market says? <laughs> have that focus in their brain what that says, but did you interview the market manager at Kimor Farmers Market? Not at the Saturday market. Did you request it? No, because I was only looking at FMO members and Saturday market is not. <coughs> What's an FMO? Sorry, Farmers Markets Ontario is the um, it's the organization that uh, advocates and, and promotes farmers markets and in Ontario. Public and public markets, the whole tradition, right? Right. And Peterborough's not a member. Yeah. And Peterborough Market's not a member. It used to be. It used to, yeah. Right. When I was president. Yeah. And, and the reason I, I limited it that way was so that I would start with um, a true farmer's market in my study, which means 50% plus one agricultural producers. So that was, that was just an easy way to kind of get at that sample group. So it's not going to be a second question. <laughs> What's that? It's not going to be a second question, is it? Because we've got other people too. Go ahead, quick. Well, I'd like to focus on that. Philip said earlier about the foods allowed in the auto market, and labeling is the big thing there. We don't have any labeling in Peterborough. This statement implies that we are we don't have the pure resellers, but we do a large number. Um, the the Questionnaire that you gave, gave us, uh, Phil, I think the group would like to see what the other questions were, but I'd suggest in Peterborough, if you tried to uh, ask those questions of people in the market, you would be thrown out of the market. You would not be allowed. The vendor would have their vendor rights uh, canceled. I was recently banned from the market for life for trying to document the decisions that the market board had. On public property. And I suggest to you the issue is integrity of this community. We need integrity, we need labeling, and we shouldn't have a farmer's market that says you don't like grocery stores taking money out of the community, but we're perfectly fine with prevent, pretend farmers trucking in food barrel food. Selling it as a disguised farm. Just That's what the decision is to do. It's very disappointing. We don't have any similar people for a look at those. Thank you. We've got more than one question. If you have one, I just want to share it around. Do you still want your question? Yeah, and I'm sorry, it's not actually a question, but I just did want to make one point of clarification here that 
we're talking about the Peterborough market. Just to be clear, we have seven markets in Peterborough County, okay? And one of them in Lakefield is actually my pick verified in the same way that Philip was speaking about. So I just think that if we're going to use the term the Peterborough market, just to be clear, let's make sure that we know that in that case, you're referring to the Saturday market. Yes, okay, just point of clarification. I am not a vendor at the Peterborough market. I am a customer. And I am speaking, you're saying we should speak on behalf of our vendors, right? I confronted uh, the president of the market and asked him about the confrontations that were going on. And I was told it was none of my business. <laughs> now, why is that? I asked your friend, I wanted to hear her side of the story. And I was told she couldn't discuss it. It was none of my business. I am a customer. Why is this none of my business? It is your business. Okay. The well, short answer. Should our president of our market know that? Yes. And you're willing to discuss with me the point of transparency here? Yep. Oh. And I think it would be good if your if the president of this market that we're talking about heard similar questions from more people. An onslaught of these questions would be great. Saying that I took pictures of the market 
and that's my second letter. It basically stated, well, I'll, I'll basically state that I never took any pictures of the market, but yet apparently they have pictures of me taking pictures <laughs> at the market, which I never did. We want protection. We have had people that have uh, been kicked out of the market. We have people that uh, are on the verge of being kicked out. We have people that are afraid of the market. They have security it's, guards walking up and down intimidating people. That's yeah. about a half the market. I've been pulled out of the market by two security men at the main GM meeting because I asked a question as to whether this gentleman, Greg Nifton, why he was not allowed at the meeting. He has been with me selling my product from day one at the market. We had children there, we had whole families there, but they had circled his name and put, and put above it, reject. <laughs> so when I confronted them, I was allowed in. So when I confronted them inside the market, I was told that I was harassing them. And I had a security man on each man arm take me out of the building. If it wasn't for John Dunn and Sam McLean, who, who was involved in this, and uh, other people, I would not have been able to get back into the meeting. How fair is that for vendors? Could, could help, 
the other thing I'd love to see is that um, members of the community are invited to come to the AGM and ask questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> much secrecy and certainly um, I don't think that they're following their own uh, uh, guidelines especially with regards to uh, the operation of uh, uh, board meetings etc uh, it just seems like it's a uh, one person show and that person is dictating what goes on and it's uh, it's unfortunate because uh, it's a wonderful market um, I just think that it's really sad that um, people are, are being harassed, bullied, yes. kicked off. Uh, there's just no way to have uh, uh, a good communal spirit. Certainly if the public really know what's going on down there, they're going to feel a little bit different about what's going on at the market, uh, which is really sad because it, it's a wonderful historical market. Uh, They've tried to broaden out the representation on the market of various vendors. Um, you know, I, I thought that uh, when I was on the board, uh, right from being sort of a low person on the totem pole, that we really worked together as a board really well. And now it just seems like you are open to the situation that um, people that have a different agenda can really hijack things, and, and that's really unfortunate. I don't know what the resolution is, but I would suggest that something where there's some kind of mediator that comes in to bring parties together, because my sense is that the resellers are fighting back big time, thinking that people want to get rid of the resellers. And I think Philip has suggested there, it's a big enough tent for all people to still participate, but be transparent about it, not pretend that you're a, a farmer. Yeah,